سورہ جس میں ہمیں بتلایا کہ دنیا کی چیزیں جو ہیں وہ یہاں اچھی لگتی ہیں مگر اصل چیز جو ہے وہ آخرت ہے تو ٹوڈیز لیکچر از اباؤٹ ایکچولی ڈو آپولیز بفور وی اسٹارٹ دا لیکچر ون تھنگ ویری امپورٹنٹ ٹو ریئلائز از دیٹ وی آر اسٹڈینگ میٹا تھیوری وچ مینس دیٹ وی آر میکنگ تھیوریز اباؤٹ تھیوری ناؤ دیر آر ٹو ویری امپورٹنٹ تھنگز دیٹ you must learn if you are going to be a meta theoretician you see when you study theories then you have to be cold and unbiased so for example somebody is saying that democracy is good somebody is saying military rule is good somebody is saying islam is good somebody is saying no christianity is good in all cases you have to stand back you cannot be a participant you cannot say that no it can hinduism can never be good Uh, you have to say okay yani you have to uh, take that yani uh, to understand a theory you have to enter into it so you have to lay aside all your prejudices so you can't say this is good inequality is good rich people should get money or no we should help the poor all of these are different theories and all of them we are standing standing above these theories so none of these theories actually enter our heart at one level at the other level at the same time paradoxically and to understand a theory you have to put your heart into it so if somebody says that hinduism is the only true religion you have to say okay what is the mindset which will lead one to believe that hinduism is the only true religion so you have to set aside all your islamic ideas and you have to say okay there is this person i have to understand his theory of the world so I am going to put away all my beliefs and I am going to say okay there is ha- Laat and Habal and Uzza and these are the gods now how does one think when one thinks like that so to understand theories you have to uh, you have to enter into them for that you have to lay aside your preconceptions okay so this is just a necessary thing to under if you are looking at different theories and how they act then you see this is the theory what is the effect of this theory you are studying the theory you are not entering into the theory all right so actually people who have bicultural experience are very experienced with this yani somebody is brought up in a family in pa- pakistan then he moves to america he enters an entirely alien culture so he learns to look at world in two different ways he has one glasses and he sees things from pakistani perspective and he takes off the glasses she thinks from american perspective and the world looks very different and there is no comparison between the two and you just understand that you can't say that this is wrong or that is right this is wrong from the framework of the pakistani point of view but and if for example if two friends are going then in pakistani perspective it is uh, both should not pay for their own cup of tea one of them should pay in the american perspective both people should pay their own and if somebody uh, yani they shouldn't pay for each other so it looks very different so anyway those people who have the bi- what is the norm and what is the against norm it's, it's just a convention it changes so uh, to understand theories you have to rise above them all right so now what we are going to study is just from the last lecture we discussed this and we are going to discuss this example again in greater detail uh so i'm just uh, looking at the uh couple of things couple of lines um if i set price equal to 60 the demand is 700 the revenue is 42000 and the cost is 25 times 7 which is 175000 uh 
and then there is any sorry seventeen thousand five hundred and then there is a five hundred additional fixed cost so my cost is eighteen thousand so my profit is twenty four thousand if I uh, manufacture seventy sorry I, I sell seventy units of ice cream <coughs> I can only sell six hundred units uh, again uh, revenue is forty two thousand but the cost is now lower uh, it's 15,500 so my profit is higher um, okay so that's when you have a monopolist now we are considering the case of the duopoly in the duopoly I have two sellers and for the moment we are just looking at two possible moves either you can produce 60 and 60 this is analogous to the betray betray because actually if you look at 70 70 Suppose that, yani, suppose that the monopolist is selling at 70. If the other person cooperates with him, he also sells at 70. He doesn't try to steal his customers. Then they will both split the pot and they will both get 13,750. Because that's half of what uh, the one guy was making minus the fixed cost. Now, um, so that's the cooperate cooperate strategy. Both player play nice guy now suppose the one uh, the new entrant which is why decides to betray he decides to uh, uh, play selfishly and he says okay I'll, I'll uh, do maximum damage to him so X plays 70 uh, the X line is in the uh, column the first column and Y plays 60 now he takes all the customers away according to the neoclassical theory we will later change this assumption because this is not a a, a good assumption that uh, you have perfect information and zero cost so you can as soon as he announces 60 everybody finds out and everybody goes to him so what but suppose this for the moment then what will happen X will have zero because nobody will go to him Y will have 20 all the customers and that's he's selling at 60 and so he gets um, 24,000 what 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 42 oh actually yeah 24,000 is the profit yes so he sells uh, at, at 60 he sells 700 ice creams and his profit is 24,000 so this is the this is always the case when you betray the person uh, the person who cooperates gets uh, this is known as the sucker payoff. There, is, there are three major names in the prisoner demo. The sucker payoff means that you trusted the other guy, but the other guy betrayed you, and you got played for a sucker, a fool, and uh, you get zero. So, so the sucker payoff here is zero. The mutually cooperative pay, payoff is thirteen thousand seven hundred fifty, and the uh, 24,000 this is called the temptation payoff and he suppose both people agree to cooperate then um, the guy thinks that what will happen if I betray him that's being selfish and uh, and actually going against your word then uh, the amount you are getting will matter so 24,000 is a lot you're going to double your payoff sometimes the different depending on the game the temptation payoff can be smaller so then you might say that okay I don't uh, I, I will let go for example suppose that this payoff is 15,000 so you are getting 13,750 by cooperating and if you betray the other guy you will get 5,000 you say okay I don't want to um, I don't want uh, to uh, sell my integrity for such a small price I will sell it for a bigger price <laughs> so in that case so, so the level of temptation matters the sucker payoff also uh, this is called the risk uh, this is called the risk in the sense that suppose I, I want to trust you and cooperate so what is the risk to me of of uh, trusting you well if you betray me I'll get zero so the difference between these two 13 I, I will lose 13,000 by trusting you so that's called the risk all right uh, okay so now how do we analyze this game well we are going to uh, study this and learn this this is one of the goals of this lecture that you will be learned 
how to analyze these two player games and how to understand what will happen according to the classical theory of games. Later on we will see that this classical theory of games doesn't work but at the moment we were studying just the simple classical theory of games. So everybody, okay so uh, when you think about the simultaneous game move, yani both of the people are deciding at the same time, then it is difficult because you don't know what he is going to do. So it's much easier to think of the sequential game. So in the sequential game, the first player makes a move and then that's what you played. One player makes a move, then, then you decide, then you get to choose. So suppose that X chooses 60. Now what is your best move as Y? Well, if you pay 70, you will lose and so you should play 60 because you will get. So the when X plays 60, Y's best response is 60. What happens if X plays 70? Y's best response is still 60 because so this is the case in which you say that Y has a dominant strategy. Aankh band karke, he can write down 60 because regardless of what X does, 60 is the best move. 60 is the best response to all moves. The same holds for X. The game is symmetric. If X analyzes his game, his best response to all moves of Y is 60. And so, uh, according to standard theory, uh, both guys will play 60 and they will both get 11,500. This is called the social dilemma. Why it is social dilemma? It's a paradox because if both people cooperate and play 70, both can do better. So, um, why should the, you know, there, there is a conflict between optimal strategy and what uh, normal human beings would call optimal strategy. If both people play 70, both people do better. So, I mean, it's Pareto inferior outcome. So, why not figure out some way to cooperate so both can do good instead of uh, uh, betraying each other, both of them stick the knife in each other's back, both of them bleed instead, uh, both of them die instead, why don't pe both people keep their knives in their own pockets and both people are happy. Uh, so this is called the social dilemma because the individual incentive conflicts with the social outcome and this is the typical case. What economics textbooks try to teach you is the opposite, that every, everybody acts uh, selfishly, it will be the best for society. But as you can see in Prisoner's Dilemma, this is not true. This is the exact opposite of the invisible hand. Now suppose that both players play 60-60, play then there is a new Prisoner's Dilemma because actually you see once both people are playing 60-60, then 70 is no longer a viable strategy because uh, all higher moves get, get you zero. But the lower strategy now comes in and you can try to undercut your opponent. So at the next round you can try to say, okay, he's playing 60, let me try 50. And so uh, as we discussed in the previous lecture, if this process continues, again 50-50 is going to be a Nash equilibrium. And so it's very strange, both people just keep undercutting each other and they, they end up with the bottom of the profit. So there is a conflict between economic, this is what the theory predicts. But the reality is not like that. In the reality, even in Prisoner's Dilemma game, like the one that you played, this has been played in many thousands of people because of uh, this is a fundamental dilemma. Uh, the theory predicts something, but the reality of human behavior is very different. So why is there this discrepancy? Also in uh, Prisoner's Dilemma, we see cooperation a lot of time. So how, how can people cooperate? Especially, you see now, economic theories, theorists who see that actually, you see this, I, I told you in the earlier lecture, there's a difference between behavioral economics and theoretical economics. Now theoretical economics says that no one will ever cooperate. Behavioral economics says that people cooperate a lot of time. So now why is there this difference? There is some mismatch between what theory is saying, what human beings really do. So how can we fix the theory to, uh, to match what humans do? So um, there is a, a book, a, a paper by Mengel recently 
in which he studies well first of all when you look at what is the behavior theory theory is very simple the theory method there is no variation everybody always betrays and there is no question about this but in in human behavior there is a lot of variation and you saw that there was a lot of variation people are betraying people are cooperating people are doing c b b c everything is happening in in, in reality in general uh if you as i said thousands of studies there are he picks out 80 studies and does a meta study a study of studies so in this meta study he found that the level of cooperation varies from 3% to 83% so again there's very wide range so what explains in what kind of games will we get high cooperation and in what kind of games will we get low cooperation so basically he says that there are two factors risk and temptation the risk is how much you lose when the other party betrays this is the price that you pay for trusting so he says that if the risk is high then people don't cooperate if the risk is low then people cooperate he says that temptation doesn't matter that's uh, strange so what does it mean about character it means that people would like to trust others but they are afraid of taking the chance and people are not worried too much about yani uh, people are not thinking about uh betraying the other so you see there are two possible reasons for betraying one is to take advantage of the other guy and uh, to make profits by in that case you will deceive the other person you will say that oh i'm going to cooperate i'm such a nice and honest person and uh, all the time thinking that once he agrees to cooperate then i'm going to stick the knife in his back um the other way is that well i would really like to cooperate but i don't know if i can trust you that's the that's the other way of thinking i'm i'm an honest guy i don't want to betray you but i don't want to take the risk that you will betray me and i'll end up with zero so then the question is what is the ch- how much yani if you have a stranger and you are going to trust him then the question is how much will you lose by trusting him so that's the risk factor so according to the meta study mostly people are concerned with risk if the risk is low they cooperate if the risk is high then they don't cooperate so much and so that means that basically the character of the people is towards trust it is not towards betrayal it's honesty except that you want to be cautious while being honest so this is what the empirical studies show now there were three games that were played we are going to look at those three games the first game which was played by these six people this has <coughs> low temptation uh this was the payoffs if both people betray they get 5 uh when you cooperate uh the cooperator loses everything and the betrayer get, gets a little bit extra only 25% so as the empirical meta study shows the temptation doesn't matter very much it's the risk which caused so in this game we would expect to see a lot of betrayals because there is a very high risk from uh, trusting the other because you lose everything you have 15 if you cooperate and you lose uh, you get zero if you uh, if the other guy betrays you so in this game we would expect to see lot of betrayals i'm going to analyze the output uh and see if that's so agar mujhe de do to i can have one quick look and see what happens yes, hmm. so scoring sheet 1 pe uh apne diya nahi this is scoring sheet, sheet. sheet. sahi so sheet 1 pe i see something like 50 50 betrayal sorry uh, sheet 1 uh, i got to two off and roughly all right now scoring sheet 2 pe we are going to go now according to the theory that we have been studying 
um, this is going to be a high betrayal game uh, it's going to be high betrayal not because people are are untrustworthy because but people are un afraid to take the risk of trusting others this is scoring sheet 2 here there is lower risk because uh, if you uh, if you cooperate and you are betrayed you lose only 5 points you had 15 from a cooperate cooperate and now you only have 10 so here uh, we expect to see more cooperation however I don't see it on these sheets I think that people have having trouble understanding the game and so I see I see a lot of uh, betrayals on scoring sheet too so yani, uh, according to the theory in, uh, in uh, game 2 you should have a lot of cooperation uh, relative to game 1 in game 1 you should have lot of betrayal game 2 you should have lot of cooperation because the risk uh, from uh, cooperation is lower but it may not happen now game 3 is a very interesting game which nobody understood uh, as far as I could see from their sheets yeah nobody understood this game alright since nobody understood I am going to ask you to analyze this ok what how should players play this game if you are playing this game with cooperation is the best it, if both cooperate both will get 10 in five uh, in six rounds they will have 60 but there are better ways to play this game what yes if both people play betray they will all get zero but there are better ways to play this game exactly you are right this is called the alternating betrayal game basically you cooperate at betraying each other so because the the temptation payoff is very high here it's 50 so you basically come to an agreement that one time I will uh, turn you in and I will collect the reward <laughs> and then you turn me in and I will collect you collect the reward so as long as they so this is high level of cooperation where and especially with no signaling which is what I wanted uh, you, people can learn to cooperate that okay yani, uh, after a few tries you say that okay we will alternate you betray on this round I betray on the other round that way in six games both will have 150 by betraying half the time uh, but you have to coordinate with each other so this is, requires high level of coordination to play this properly uh, but nobody was able to even see this strategy ok so that is the empirical uh, evidence the behavioral economics the behavioral economics shows yani there is C's all over the place now according to economic theory there should not be even one C on any one sheet it just doesn't make any sense so from the economic theory actually economic theory really blinds economists yani the economists have a really difficult time understanding why there is cooperation human beings don't have difficulty that's um, uh, in general in s with stranger one shot games you see about 20 percent cooperation <coughs> so uh, and uh, some economists thought economists are especially saying that oh you know with points and with the uh, little bit of money people are not serious people are not understanding what is going on if there was big money involved then um, any in initially when game theorists started playing games and, and went to the economists that look your theories are completely contradicted by the games so they say oh you know you are playing games in labs with ten dollars twenty dollars uh, our theories apply to business where people have million dollars at stake and so on so there is this TV show 
uh, UK TV show called Golden Balls. I don't know anything about it, but it's described in the article. And in it, there, there is this uh, split or steal game in which there is a huge prize, and both uh, both parties have to decide: Are we going to split the prize, or are we going to try to steal it? So, if one side says steal and the other side says split, then the stealer gets everything. If the uh, both sides split, then they get half. If both sides steal, then nobody gets anything. So this is very high uh, stakes uh, prisoner's dilemma. So what really happens? According to the game theory, it should be steal, steal because uh, that is the dominant strategy. If the other guy is playing split, then steal gives you a huge reward. If the other guy is playing steal, then uh, for you to uh, split would be ridiculous. And so again, steal is the better strategy. So in, in all cases, steal is the dominant strategy. According to game theory, both people should always steal. Of course, it doesn't happen. About 30% of the cases we see uh, the split split in the reality with very high stakes. Playing so, the game, sir, playing the game, sir, I thought that I had nothing to lose if I, if I write a cooperation or return. So I really thought about this, that if I had to lose a lot of things like billions and millions, I would have uh, thought a little bit, I, would choose, I should be a little bit more conscious about it. Yes, yes, I think that there were two factors for which this these results are not representative. People didn't understand the game and then also the stakes were not uh, clear uh, how important it is. But anyway, even with 20% or 30% cooperation which occurs in reality with experienced subjects in labs with real money, uh, so cooperation definitely occurs. Nobody can, yani you can say 100% that the economic theory is not practiced by human beings. Human beings do not play the dominant strategy. So then there is a real question as to why not. Now economic theorists are very, 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 very reluctant to give up the maximization idea. So what they do is they say, okay, uh, the reason for this is that you have a repeated game. So this game is going to be played not one time but many times. and. Um, <laughs> so, or actually in your life is a repeated game. So, you are going to play. So, if you um, betray once, uh, you, you, you make a temporary limited short term gain, but then you sacrifice the possibility of cooperation in the long run. And of course, cooperation is better for both in the long run. So, in one short game, it is okay. You can betray, but in a long run game, you should not be betraying. So, unfortunately for economists, they wanted to show that <laughs> cooperation occurs because of multiple games. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma, uh, the, the strict solution to it, even if the game is repeated 10 times or 20 times or any finite number of times, you get exactly the same result. The player should betray on every round of the game. This is a very strange result. Theory says that this is your optimizing behavior over the whole game. Now, intuitively, it seems it seemed to everybody that over a range of games, it is better to cooperate some of the time that because um, uh, um, you get higher payoffs. But economic theory says that no. Uh, the standard theory of game says no. You should betray every time. So there is a reasoning for this that is important in solving games. And so I'm going to go through this and then later on maybe we will look at it even more carefully when we study game theory in detail. Right now we are studying just the prisoners repeated prisoner's dilemma. So suppose we have only two rounds of prisoner's dilemma. So I'm going to play with fixed partner two games. Now uh, from the first game it seems that Look, why not? Why don't I try to cooperate on this round? Or maybe uh, two is just to simplify, to so we can understand. Maybe it's four or five or six. Let me just try 
I can't lose much. I I try to cooperate, and if uh, my partner cooperates also, then we both win, and we can try to continue in this way, and we will both be better off by cooperating. So let me try. So it turns out that if you um, the way to solve games is that uh, at this point from the first game uh, the the tree diagram that you draw for the game is very complicated it's hard to figure out so the way that you solve games which are complicated is uh, called backward induction you go to the last game and say what will happen in the last game so let's say i have nine games to play and in all nine games we have both cooperated right it doesn't matter actually what we did but suppose that we managed to cooperate now we are playing the 10th game the last game after that i will say salam and i will never see you again so now what should i do yes the reason that i was cooperating in earlier games was because in the future there were more games to play and so i wanted to get a higher payoff by cooperating but now there is no longer no no more games to play this is the last game so my dominant strategy in the last game is betray now the thing is that both players are making this calculation so in the light last game what will happen if both players are rational and uh, robots that's what uh, economics is concerned with the behavior of robots not with human beings because uh, human beings don't think like this but uh, robots think like this so the robots calculate that okay he's going to betray me i'm going to betray there's nothing to do uh, so now okay so the last round we know both people are going to betray now we come to the n minus 1 round this is what backward intent we we work backwards now in n minus 1 round i know exactly what's going to happen in the next round both people are going to betray now so uh, my the reason for my cooperation in this round was that i could maybe get cooperation on the next one but i know that i'm not going to get cooperation on the next so there's no point in cooperating in this one so my optimal strategy becomes again betray if the other guy cooperates he's going to lose because next round both are betraying for sure so the other guy also calculates exactly the same way and so both betray and you can work this backwards and it goes all the way back to the, no matter how many if you're playing 100 games the optimal rational strategy for both to betray all the time this is a completely ridiculous result but the rational optimal calculation gives only this result there is no other solution to the game every other solution is dominated now the true uh, the reality is that sir sir if we compare this example with that uh, one of the chokma example in which we had ended at 30 so we can use game theory there the centipede game that we would stick on 80 80 and we won't go further cutting We will cooperate in the very first time to What? sell chalk bars at 80. So the price won't go down. And That is exactly the prisoner's dilemma. If you are cooperating at 80, 80, both sides have an incentive to cut the price to 70. And according to game theory, both will cut, but actually human beings will not. But there is reason for that. So uh, now the empirical evidence about how human beings actually behave <coughs> is that human beings do not use backward induction so when they are going uh, forward this is not rational this is not the optimal calculation this is how human beings behave i look only at what's going to happen in this game and maybe in the future i don't i don't go to the last game and say okay people are going to betray so then i work backwards that's the optimal calculation so actually the truth is people do not maximize people behave in different ways so this idea that people are maximizing there are actually two ideas one is that everybody always maximizes the second idea which is even worse is that i know that my opponent is always going to maximize so i calculate on the basis of the assumption that he is always going to look after his interest now even if i am a completely selfish cold hearted and and a robotic person with no emotions i should not calculate that the other person is also like that so if the other person i think is a human being and he might cooperate with me uh, he might be irrational and cooperate with me then i also have incentive to cooperate and this is how human being all human beings are acting in ways which are irrational according to the economics 
but actually human beings are very smart much smarter than the economic robots so uh, because economists can't understand the prisoner's dilemma they, so they say that okay let's look at the, in the finite horizon math does not solve the problem so let's look at an infinite horizon game the game continues until infinity now <coughs> if the game continues in until infinity <coughs> then it is possible for cooperative strategies to emerge but then it becomes very very complicated to analyze and what happens is that there are many many Nash equilibria many many ways that people can play so some ways are cooperative some are not so cooperative and there is no real solution in the infinite horizon game so again economists simply fail to understand what is happening in the prisoner's dilemma because the theory gives us no guidance to human behavior and that is uh, the way with all economic theory it is completely useless to understand the real world all right so the lesson that is learned from this is that there is no equilibrium and we will see that more um, things keep changing and so what is very important is what happens in disequilibrium this is something that the economists never consider I mean if you look at chapter 1 and the first introduction uh, variant starts by saying look we are going to have opt optimization and we are going to have equilibrium these are the two things we are going to do from the beginning it's, uh, this is uh, taken from granted after that so uh, how what will happen in games depends on what uh, disequilibrium will automatically and always take place as we will see and once you are in disequilibrium then how do people what rule do people follow to try to get out of disequilibrium this rule cannot be calculated by optimization and this rule uh, the economists don't even bother to calculate so how do people behave in situations where maximization is not possible there are many different possibilities and depending on what uh, which rule is taken different kinds of uh, equilibria will emerge and this is actually called uh, evolutionary economics and this is the wave of the future so we tell people we say this person is a cooperative person he generally will be cooperating now this is the rule that he follows it's not he's not maximizing he's a he's a rule follower this person is a betrayer he is an economist he has been brainwashed into thinking so now what will happen if these two people play now we we study the rules that they use and how they behave against each other there is no maximization so this is a different way to think about the problem and this is what I'm going to try to teach you in this course how to think about evolutionary processes all right so now what we are doing is uh, to look at this model more carefully um, I have given you a homework in which you are going to have to do these calculations so if you don't understand uh, and that's due on this Sunday so I'm going to show I'm going to make this calculation I also have the Excel spreadsheet on which I did this so if you have problems we can show it to you I think this part is fairly easy let's look at this if you have problems but uh, do ask otherwise you won't be able to do it all right so here we have the full information zero transaction cost market <clears throat> in the first table I have the number of customers this is how you're going to have to do your calculations so at 30 30 you have 1000 customers and if both people are offering 30 then they will split so this is I'm, I, this is I'm looking at the number of the customers that P1 will have and you are going to make similar calculations in a game that you have been assigned so you better understand how these calculations are being made so at 30 30 the total number of customers is 1000 and they both split so they both get 500 now if P1 uh, this table provides the number of customers for P1 only P2 is uh, symmetric so you can figure it out but you have to reverse the column and row so now if P1 uh, says my price is 40 then he will get zero customers if he says 50 he will also get zero customers so all prices which are higher than the P2 price will have zero customers 
This is the full information zero transaction cost model. I will change that model later to see what happens. Now if P2 is offering 40, then if you offer 30, you steal all his customers. You get 1,000. If, uh, uh, if you match his price, then you split the customers. This time there are only 900 customers because the price is now 40, uh, which, which, means less the, which means that the 1,000 customers you have at 30 become 900. So similarly, if both people are playing 50, then they split the 800 customers and both have 400. If both people are playing um, 60, then they split the 700 customers. Okay, and if uh, the P1 has the lower price, then he gets all the customers at that price. So at 40, the number of customers total is 900. And uh, whenever your price is lower, you get all 900. At 50, you get all 800 customers. At 60, you get all 700. At 70, you get all 600. At 80, you get all 500. So you understand how to make the first graph. Now, the second chart is we calculate the profits. And this can be done in Excel easily by linking this cell to the previous one. And so if you put the right formula in this, cor uh, in this cell, then you can just copy it and all the cells will calculate that formula. And if you don't know how to do that, you just have to work a little bit harder. Uh, <coughs> so here, how do we get this 2000? Well, we are calculating the profits for P1, not for P2. So P1 is, uh, is selling 500, that's in the 3030 in the top. So he is getting uh, price 30, so 30 times 500 is 15,000. But he is paying cost 25 rupees per uh, unit. So uh, that's uh, basically 2,500 of profits left. And he has a fixed cost of 500, so his profit is 2,000. At all other values, he just pays his fixed cost, which is 500. So he's losing 500 because he, he sells nothing. Now in the second column, uh, at this point, the 4,500 comes by taking 1,000, multiplying by 30, so you get 30,000 of revenue. Then you have 25,000 of cost, and then 500 fixed costs. So your profit is 4,500. Everybody understands this clearly? Okay. Now at 40, 40 something interesting happens. You have 450. You, you lost a lot of customers. I mean, when you undercut his price by 30, you got all the 1,000 customers. But you were only selling at 30. So if you go up to 40, you are selling at 40. You are only getting... 500, uh, 450 customers, but still you make a lot of money by because you are selling a, uh, at a higher price, 25% higher. And after deducting the cost, you get 6,250, which is still higher. So in this particular case, it doesn't pay to undercut because the additional revenue you get from undercutting does not match what you can get at the higher price. So that's 6,250, everything else is. 500. In this way, we have made all the calculations. And I will uh, give you the Excel spreadsheet also, uh, so, so you can see how the formulas are. Um, I will load it on the website. So, all right, so now we have calculated all of the things. Now, the key thing that I want to teach you is how to solve this game. And that is the, the, uh, the main thing that uh, I want to teach you in this lecture. So the game solution works exactly like this. Uh, we will think about sequential solving. So we say that, okay, P2 makes his move. He chooses one of these things. He chooses either 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. He has to make the first move. All right. So now I choose my best response. So if P2 chooses 30, my best response is 12,000, which is highlighted in bold. If... Uh, uh, P2 chooses 40. Hey, what happened? Oh, this is a different game. I, I, I somehow moved the slide. Okay. Um, now, if P2 chooses 40, my best response is 40. Again, it is not 30. Uh, undercutting does not pay. 
Now, but if uh, P2 chase is 50, my best response is 40. That gives me 13,000. If I match, I only get 9,500. Similarly, for all higher strategies, yani whatever P2 chooses, my best response is one less than that. So if P2 chooses 90, I should respond by 80, make profits of 27,000. If P2 chooses 80, then I should respond 70. Uh, the best response to 70 is 60. The best response to 60 is 50. Best response to 50 is 40. But the best response to 40 is again 40. And the best response to 30 is again 30. So now uh, we consider the next step in this sequence. So player 2 moved one of these moves, whatever it was. And then I made my best response. Now, now I take the best response, and uh, and consider uh, myself as player two, and, and and swap the roles of player two and player one. So let's start from uh, 90, for example. Suppose so player two played 90, so player one played what 80? Yes. Now think uh, swap the roles. So now if the P2, uh, what who was P2 is now P1. So now. Um, P2 has just played 80, what I am going to play? 70. So now if the other guy plays 70, what I am going to play? 60. And uh, 60? 50. And 50? And 40? And then what will happen? Huh? 40, 40, it will keep repeating. So we have convergence to this equilibrium. We will not converge to the 30-30 equilibrium, we will converge to the 40-40 equilibrium. Uh, because these are the best responses to each other. So the lesson is that if you have anything on the diagonal that's bold face, that is a Nash equilibrium. This is what's called a Nash equilibrium. 30-30 uh, is also a Nash equilibrium. Because if you are both playing 30, then nobody has incentive to deviate. Both strategies are best responses to each other. This is the definition of Nash equilibrium. That uh, a Nash equilibrium uh, is a pair of strategies such that both are best responses to each other. If I know that X is going to play strategy uh, A, then uh, and uh, A, A uh, is uh, then I will still play A. And if I don't. Um, and if he knows that I'm going to play A, he is still going to play A. So regardless of, of who plays first, if this pair of strategies is cho chosen, it's stable. It's not going to change. This is a strong Nash equilibrium because in a weak Nash equilibrium, some, there is some incentive to change. We'll see that. We have weak Nash equilibrium. So here we see a couple of things. If we just analyze Nash equilibrium, there, there's multiple Nash equilibrium. Uh, so we have to look at what happens in disequilibrium to understand which equilibrium is going to work out and of course this equilibrium will happen only if we start at 90-90 suppose we start at 30-30 then we will be stuck at this lower equilibrium and now this is kind of a, a bad equilibrium and I am playing 30 you are playing 30 actually I would like for both of us to shift to 40-40 but there is no quick way to do it. Yani if I shift to 40, uh, I will lose. So now in the short run, you can't in a one shot game. But suppose this is a multi shot game. Now, again, there is a difference between theory and practice. Again, economic theory says that there is no way to get out of this equilibrium. But if I take two human beings and I have given you this lesson and if I take two random people who don't know each other and cannot communicate and I ask them to play this game and I start them with okay this is how it started you have to play 30 on the first round so then what will happen I am quite sure that people are smart enough to overcome the rational behavior and one person will say 40 and take the chance and maybe the other person even Yanni doesn't take the chance and so he gets minus 500 so now but he has signaled that I am willing, ready to go to the other equilibrium. I will take the chance of losing 500. So now once he has signaled, then in the third round, the other person should respond to this signal by playing 40-40. Both are knowing to be better off. The person who took the chance and lost 500 will make up for this in the next round by gaining 4000. So it doesn't matter. I mean, a little bit of 
money sacrifice to signal to the other person that look i want let's let's move to 400 uh, you can trust me i will i will uh, i will play 40 even though it's against my interest you will both gain yeah you will both gain yeah both gain so this is and there is no communication except by moves i mean if you talk to each other of course this can happen easily but suppose that you don't talk to each other still you can get human beings can get to the 40 40 equilibrium robots cannot get to the 40 40 equilibrium because you signal uh, the other person party doesn't understand signals i mean he's being acting irrationally this robot has uh, some fuse some circuit has blown in his in his mind so uh that is what i'm saying that if you if you ask varian to analyze this game he will say well there are two nash equilibrium what will happen i don't know because there is no unique equilibrium and uh there is and uh the optimization behavior will never uh move from 30 30 to 40 40 40 but human beings can move from 30 30 to 40 40 by temporarily not maximizing by signaling that i want to cooperate i am willing to get hurt a little bit to signal my intention to this is what human beings can do the human beings have message speech which is much greater than op- than is open to maximizer so now the other person calculates that he is always maximizing he'll just get confused why is this person not maximizing but the human being will understand why this person is not maximizing so this is what we call temptation sir no no this is not temptation this is temptation is when you try to take advantage of the other and gain this is actually the opposite you are you are uh, hurting yourself to signal your that i am a nice person please cooperate with me uh, i am hurting myself to help you Yes, that's true. But in the short run, he is accepting a loss in order to do so, and he is cooperating in the sense that let us both work together to get a better outcome. Now, this is a variant of the model. This is the same model. I have done the calculations with uh, when the f- uh, when the cost fixed cost is. Five rupees, not twenty-five rupees. You can buy the ice cream for five rupees. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same. And now the numbers change like this. And now thirty thirty is the only unique Nash equilibrium. And um, uh, so now you will have convergence to thirty thirty. And now, again, this is the Nash equilibrium. So what will happen in in this game is that. if people start out at 80 80 which is the monopolist equilibrium then one will undercut to 70 other will undercut to 60 then 50 40 30 30 and they will get stuck at 30 30 but that's for rational robots who are always maximizing if human beings play this game they will usually figure out with experience how they can cooperate and get do better um then uh, so basically you sacrifice short term personal gains in order to get social benefit so this is again a social dilemma in which human beings can resolve social dilemmas but robots cannot so maximization behavior again leads and this is sort of paradoxical that if you try to maximize you end up with the worst result and if you don't try to maximize you get a good result so that's why again what we are saying that these two principles maximization and equilibrium are just ridiculous they make the economists blind to the reality of human behavior all right now we study the second problem that arises in this game which is the assumption of full information and zero cost it is really ridiculous to say that one ice cream person is 70 and the other is 60 and then all the customers will go to the 60 person it doesn't happen like that in reality so now what is uh, so we we make a more realistic assumption and then we calc- make the calculation again so what we do is a very simple modification very sensible one so suppose that when you raise price 
uh, to 40 uh, then uh, the following thing happens so I'm considering uh, the thing you see the economics have the law of one price the law of one price says that and law of one price is based precisely on this full information zero transaction cost one has 30 one has 40 everybody goes to 30 so there's never any possibility of have seeing two prices but if you have two prices it means that there must be information cost and we, and we know from our real world experience that there are multiple prices uh, you have two thela walas that are sitting, sitting next to each other and one is selling tomatoes for 25 rupees the other one is selling for 30 rupees and uh, this happens all the time so we know that multiple price and why because it costs you a little bit to move from one tailor to the other tailor <laughs> so uh, so we make an assumption in this game to analyze this situation multiple prices so suppose that at 30 there are a thousand people who are willing to pay at 40 there are 900 people so there is 100 people we will say okay those 100 people will go all to the 300 uh, all to the uh, all to the 30 person but the, there are 900 people who are willing to pay both 30 and 40 so let's just split them evenly we think that these two people are standing in the park and the people are randomly walking by so whoever is first uh, to hit they will buy from if they are if they have the if he has something at their price so the people who are willing to pay 40 or more they will buy from the first person they meet and the first person can be equally the 31 or the 41 so there are 900 people so 450 will go to the 40 price one and 450 plus 100 550 will go to the 30 price one okay so now we can do the calculations according to this uh, new model and we can do the calculations and we find that now it will pay to raise prices and the other person can have a low price and I can have a higher price previously it was not possible because if you have a higher price you lose everything but that's not realistic so uh, this is the argument by Stiglitz that if there is information cost if there is transaction cost then suppose that we are in competitive equilibrium and everybody has the same price if one person raises the price by a little bit then he will not lose any customers because that little bit is less than the transaction cost but once one person has raised the price uh, other people can also raise prices and if everybody raises the prices then we have again a second round of equilibrium where everywhere is a little bit higher prices and then again we can repeat this process so people can converge to the monopolistic equilibrium the point of this is that the perfect competition, uh, competition uh, assumption is very fragile uh, very sensitive to the assumption of full information and if people think that okay yes we are assuming full information approximately it's true but actually if it's only a little bit violated if there's a transaction cost of of only a small amount he says that suppose that the transaction cost is only two rupees then everybody can raise the price by one rupee without any change but once everybody has changed it increased by one rupee then you can repeat it again and so it can go up to infinity so even a very small change in this assumption can lead to very big change in the outcome all right now we are going to do the calculation and again you have been asked to do this calculation in your homework so you better understand how this table is made so now this is the same graph same table as before but with more realistic assumptions no full information no law of one price and so now at 30 30 we have the same four uh, 500 split but now suppose that one person charges 40 and the other one is charging uh, 30 then the 40 person will get 450 he will get the 900 people who are uh, willing to pay uh, 40 rupees half of them and similarly at 50 there are 800 people who are willing to pay uh, 50 rupees so he will get 400 the other guy will get the other 400 plus whatever he is uh, making for the other so he will get uh, uh, more but I am not calculating that I am just calculating the P1 customers here so basically every time you raise the price you lose 50 customers because you are previously it was going down by 100 but now you are uh, you are losing 100 uh, you lose 100 
but half of them are um, are are lost to the other person so uh, basically it just goes down by 50 now um, if your price is 50 then there are 800 customers who are yours at that price half of them so this remains 400 until you get to a match 50 50 at which you exactly split now when you go to the other side then the calculations go on the different direction now the 60 is the higher price and yours is the lower price so the calculations go uh, differently and we can make those calculations so so uh, above the diagonal calculations are done differently below the cal uh, diagonal calculations are done differently here you see once you have the lower price then um, as soon as he uh, then you gain 50 customers for each uh, uh, each time he increases the price you gain 50 customers right that's clear uh, so 550 600 650 700 750 800 similarly the pattern so above the diagonal as you go across the row you gain 50 in each each step below the diagonal you lose 50 uh, down the column so it's very simple it's easy to understand now in the bottom we calculate the p1 profits so the profits are again the same calculation as before um, if you are selling 500 at 30 you are making 15,000 your costs are uh, uh, 25 times uh, so basically you are making 5 rupees on each unit you sell so 5 times 500 is 2,500 and then 500 fixed cost so your uh, gain is 2000 at 40 you are selling 450 units you are making 5 rupees let's let's do a more even number at 50 you are selling 400 you are making 5 rupees per unit so you get 5 times 4 2000 what oh yes you are making 25 not 5 units that's what yeah, you're making 25 units, so you get 10,000, and then you subtract 500 to get 9,500. So actually, so I've done all the calculations here. Now, um, then, uh, then the main technique for this lecture is how to solve this game, and so we again solve by f calculating the best response. So now, if uh, player one is uh, offering 30, the cheapest possible price, what is my response? I should uh, play no not 40 anymore 70 the 19,000 is the, as, as I keep increasing prices I lose customers but I make more money until I get to 70 which gives me the maximum amount of money so the best response to 30 is 70 similarly the same thing is true at 40 uh, the numbers repeat and I get 19,000 as my maximum at 70 so if the player 2 is playing 30 or 40 or 50 70 is the best response but once he comes close to me in 60 then 70 becomes uh, slightly less he is stealing a lot of customers so uh, 70 is still 19,000 but now undercutting him by 50 gives me a higher profit 19,750 if he responds by 70 then uh, again 50 is my best response at 80 I have two possible best responses uh, that's either 50 or 60 both will give me maximum profit so this is the kind of thing which leads to what is called weak Nash equilibrium and that you have two possible responses uh, and at 90 there's a unique response now so the only difference between this game and the previous game is that the variable cost has been changed it has been reduced to 5 from 25 however uh, very interesting differences emerge from making this change uh, like the previous game there are no symmetric Nash equilibria that is there is no bold face entries on the on the diagonal which means that uh, there is no one strategy which is the same for both players which is uh, a Nash equilibrium. Strangely enough, 
there are two asymmetric Nash equilibria. Uh, what that means is that the two players play different strategies. This is strange because the game is completely symmetric. Both players are identical. They have identical cost functions. They face identical environments. But nonetheless, in the Nash equilibrium, they will play two different things. So how do we find that out? We can just look. Uh, we can just start the game anywhere. So one player plays 90. In response, the other player will play 60. Now, uh, because that's the best strategy against 90. Now, when the one player plays 60, the other player will play 50. Now, in response to 50, the best strategy is 70. And now, when the one player plays 70, the best strategy is 50. So, 70 and 50 are both best strategies against each other. And that is the definition of Nash equilibria. So, there are two asymmetric Nash equilibria. Uh, first player plays 50, the other players play 70, and then both are playing best strategies and they will not shift. Uh, or the first player plays 70 and the second player plays 50, and then again this is a Nash equilibrium. So there are multiple Nash equilibria. Both of these Nash equilibria violate the law of one price. That is, you have two sellers who are near to each other, they are selling the same good, but they are selling it at different prices. This is very strange uh, and very different from what economic theory says. Uh, not only uh, the multiple equilibria create other kinds of problems as well, because now economic theory cannot predict which of the two equilibria will emerge. Actually, it depends on the initial and starting conditions as to what will happen next. Uh, depending on where you start, you, you could get to one or the other equilibrium. And uh, this creates problems for economic. Are there any Nash equilibrium in this game? There is no Nash equilibrium. There is no best pair. So what will happen? What will happen is what's uh, called cycling. Uh, if, assuming the game is played sequentially. Let's start by saying that okay, player two will play eighty. Uh, then what will player uh, one do? He can play fifty or sixty. Let's suppose he plays sixty. So player he plays 80 he plays 60 what happens next mm -hmm. 60 ki response kya hai? 50 50 ki response kya hai? 70 70 ki response kya hai? no what is the response to 70 50 so basically actually it will cycle i will uh, play 70 you will play 50 um, then um, in response to 50, I will play 70. Actually, it gets uh, and it gets stuck like that. 50, 70, 50, 70, 50, 70. Uh, yeah, actually, in multiple rounds, so you can you can switch. I mean, 50, 70. Then um, depending on well, actually, uh, one thing very important. This sequencing is uh, is a mental concept. It doesn't actually happen if you're playing simultaneously. Then many different things can happen. Also, the order of the play matters a lot. Depends on who moves first, who moves second. Things can change. So, um, what will happen in this game will depend on exactly how we sequence things. Uh, what if if both players come with uh, unknown amounts, not knowing what the other guy is going to do? That's a different situation, which we will analyze later on. Uh, it doesn't actually match anything that we have done, but it's not so easy to analyze. So uh, we haven't uh, studied it. But the thing is that there is no there is no Nash equilibrium. There is no convergence. There is no equilibrium. So this is what I was trying to point. I was trying to uh, make in the earlier lectures that the economists study equilibrium, but in dynamical systems there is often no equilibrium, and there are cycles. That is what I was showing with the grass and uh, cow example. There is no equilibrium. So, sorry, we didn't do grass and cow. Did we do grass yes, and cow? Yes, we did grass and cow, yeah. So, in most complicated system, there is no equilibrium. If there is an equilibrium, there is no guarantee of convergence to that equilibrium. Uh, there are often multiple equilibrium. Equilibrium act in different ways. Some equilibriums are attractors, some are repellers. When you come close to that equilibrium, you are thrown away from it. So all kinds of complex behavior take place. So if you want to understand a complex system, you have to get out of equilibrium. Unfortunately, 
economists are trapped inside equilibrium so they can't understand the real world so now uh, I want to explain the sequencing of decisions how this is important and how it matters basically what uh, the economist says is that player one will choose Q1 player one will choose Q2 so that determines the total supply now actually you see what's happening is that both of these are price takers in a competitive matter so we can think that there are lots of them so they know the price then they determine the quantity according to the their known price that determines the total supply the sum of all the supplies now this sum of supplies will determine the price by the demand function so there is something very strange that is happening the price was known you use this to determine the quantity but the ultimate quantity is determined by your decision and there is no need for a match I mean you may have you may plan in fact when you're trying to take the when you're buying your ice creams you think that maybe the and, and in fact you think what will the price be or you decide okay this is what I'm going to charge uh, but ultimately when the market opens things can change because maybe you see that oh there's another person here or there are four other people here so you you had thought that I have bought um, yani 500 units I am to sell them at this price that was how you planned but after looking at the park you decide that I'm going to uh, sell at only 30 rupees because uh, otherwise I will I will make a big loss so um, things change and they must change it is not the, the only condition in which you can maximize is if you know everything you know exactly how many people are going to show up you know exactly what the price will be you know exactly uh, how many uh, pieces of gear then if you know if, if, if everybody knows everything then you can calculate and maximize in general in the real world maximization is impossible so this idea of economists that you can find out how firms will maximize and how is just impossible so you cannot understand anything about the real world by assuming that firms maximize and assuming that consumers maximize so now so as we can see uh, depending on the variation in one of these games we have no equi Nash equilibria in the other game in the other game we have two Nash equilibria both of these pose serious problems for standard economic theory um, the way that the economists work is that I choose Q1 you choose Q2 that determines the aggregate supply and now the aggregate supply determines the price and uh, this price is magically going to equilibrate I mean but who is going to calculate this price and find out the, the price at which the supply will equal demand where is it going to come from I mean uh, what the economist says there is a well, there is an uh, auctioneer he will come in he will find out he will calculate those things and he will calculate the demand and he will find out this is the price at which market will care this is stupid and ridiculous it, uh, the real world doesn't work like that uh, so some price will come up and at that price there will be disequilibrium so this is the price but uh, yeah, if there are a lot of sellers then it can happen that a price will emerge because people have a concept of fairness they will say that this is the going price you can't charge more than the going price and if every if there's lots of sellers then people can't usually deviate from that too much because the information then becomes known and if information is known then we do get that kind of property then um, so a price is determined which you can't control because you're a small seller then but but the amount that you um, brought in may not be um, equilibrium for many reasons so there might be excess supply so you go back saying tomorrow I will bring less because I can't sell that much but also there is random demand the demand itself is not fixed and determinate and known with certainty so basically the economists tell the evolutionary story which we actually want to study that okay if there is excess supply then the price will fall 
But who will lower the price? I mean, if you had a price, uh, uh, so the perfect competition assumption is fragile. It depends critically on unrealistic assumptions. In this duopoly model, which we studied, in which there is no equilibrium, what will actually happen? Uh, you can look at this, and um, you see now how can we figure out the economic theory of is of completely no help here, because there is just no equilibrium. So what will happen? I mean, the game is perfectly well defined, and we can play it. So there are two ways. There are two major methodologies in economics that are currently being used not by mainstream economists one is called evolutionary economics in evolutionary economics we provide robots with rules of behavior we say that okay in such and such situation this is how you are going to behave and then we put these players into a computer simulation and we see what happens the other way is the behavioral economics we put we take people and we run an experiment. How do people behave in this situation? And I don't know, but with experience, I would expect that people would learn to cooperate and get the, uh, you see, I think, yeah, 70-70 is a good here. You see, the... Um, if you look at 70-70, both sides are getting 19,000, both are tired of maximizing uh, because, you know, every day you have to think something new and uh, uncertain variable and people are s uh, screaming at you. So yesterday you were 70, now, now 60, now why have you raised it to 70? People don't like that. So both of you settle down at 70, both of you make 19,000. One of the persons realizes that if I cut my price to 50, I will make 19,750. But you don't go for that temporary gain because it just destabilizes the market. So this is how humans being behave because they do not maximize. Because maximization is harmful. So basically, the perfectly competition uh, competitive story is unrealistic assumption of maximization of equilibrium it's true only in an imaginary world <coughs> both government regulation and cooperation help uh, contrary to the story here for example if the people cooperate and say okay let's fix 70 then uh, the market stabilizes <coughs> government can also regulate and help by setting a ceiling on the price that will help the people. Uh, instead of 70, government can say you are uh, only allowed to sell 50. It will not cause any harm, contrary to your supply and demand model, which says that this will lead shortages and stuff. It's all lies that economists have told you. So, according to the economic theory, the main problem of the firm, uh, firm in a perfect competition is to set the level of quantity because it's a price taker. Uh, because um, uh, this is simply not true in real world. Firms are not trying to find the right quantity to set and firms are not price takers. <coughs> Basically, what the problem that you have to solve in uh, in the perfect competition is that the cost curve is uh, going down initially and then it goes up and you have to find the bottom. This is simply not true in the real world. Marginal costs are typically constant like they were in this example. <coughs> Marginal cost is constant. Uh, every additional unit costs exactly 25 rupees. <coughs> but so the problem of finding the quantity at which the marginal cost is minimum doesn't exist, has no solution. And this is the typical case. <coughs> what the blinder survey showed of real firms was that 90% of the production or more takes place under conditions either of constant marginal cost 
or decreasing marginal costs. So the main problem which is studied in 450 pages of, uh, of uh, variant and all economics text does not exist in the real world because firms are operating under conditions of constant marginal cost or declining marginal cost. In these conditions the idea of minimizing marginal cost doesn't make sense. It doesn't give you any answer. <clears throat> and the more quantity you produce, marginal cost is either fixed or it's going down. So then the issues that arise in the real world are completely different from the issues that the economists are studying. So there is an article by Arrow, uh, which uh, say in Kenneth Arrow that there is a, a missing piece in the story that we tell as economists. Arrow is pretty much neoclassical, but he is saying that uh, there is a missing element of the, the who sets the price and he, how does the price, everybody is a price taker, <coughs> nobody is a price taker. So who is going to, somebody has to go and call, today the price will be 100 rupees, then everybody can start making decisions. But if nobody is announcing the price, then where is this price coming from? So <coughs> if you take this condition seriously, then you have to say, okay, everybody will set some price. Yani, who are the agents? I mean, where is the, the, who are the people who are taking actions? The, the sellers are taking actions and the, only the sellers can sell price, set price, the buyers cannot. So however many sellers they are, they are going to set price. Now, uh, the thing is that uh, the economists are brainwashed into thinking that the law of one price holds. Now magically, we have 10 different sellers Everybody is trying to think what I am going to sell, how much I am going to sell, what price and they, they will all come up with the same number. How can this happen? It cannot happen. Uh, how, how this can happen that everybody comes in with a random price and then suddenly there is full information or people are telepathic and I can tell what the other people are thinking so I, I know what the minimum price is and then everybody matches because they know that as soon as one person announces a low price, everybody in the park will find out and they will all go to him because there is no cost to walking and there is no cost to information. Now, as long as we drop these totally ridiculous fairy tale mythical assumptions, then uh, law of one price disappears. There will be multiple prices and so now uh, this is automatically by definition a disequilibrium situation. So now you have to ask what will happen in disequilibrium? To this question, economists have no answer. But there are other people who do. Evolutionary biologists have answer. In, uh, in um, behavioral game theory, we can create an answer. We can create markets where people are selling with different prices for different goods. And we, can, uh, we, have, we have done such experiments in the past, in the last semester, where people had jobs to offer and they were uh, uh, they had different laborers, different uh, wages they were offering. So the laborers were going around to the different firms and they were offering and, and there were four different firms, they had four different wages and everybody was, because basically what the economist says is that okay you have four different firms, the one which is offering the lowest, uh, the highest wage, everybody will go to him. But this didn't happen and doesn't happen in the real world. So wage dispersion can exist, price dispersion can exist and it is natural and normal as long as you don't have full information and zero transaction cost. Okay, I think that's all for today.